was it Churchill or whoever said democracy is the worst form of government ever invented except for all the other forms, right? Polls are the worst form of prediction ever except for all the other kinds. Why do you think so many people think the polls got it wrong in 2016, Nate? This is a complicated question. Um, Make it simple. All, yeah. So there are a few things. First of all, if you look at who won and who lost, and that's the way you judge polls, then a lot of state polls did have the wrong winner. So that's one answer is that, yeah, the polls were wrong. A different answer is that actually polls were wrong, but by kind of a normal amount, and you expect polls to be off to some degree. And the fact that people couldn't see that ahead of time reflects either their preconceptions about the race or their misunderstanding about polls and shouldn't have been that much of a surprise. And in fact, Trump had a pretty good shot if you looked at the polls. And national polls were pretty good for the most part and Clinton did win the popular vote. Not that that gets her very much, but you know, she did win it um, as polls predicted. You know, if an NBA team leads by three points with four minutes to go in the game, you don't say, oh, this team is sure to win. Can't imagine anything that could happen that could possibly make them lose, right? So the polling actually showed a very competitive race in 2016. If you went to 538, that is a story that we tried to tell. It's a story our model tried to tell, where it um, gave Trump about a 30% 30, 30 chance, 3-0 on election day. We had Clinton favored, but our model had Trump as being about twice as likely to win as, as the conventional wisdom thought. Has polling changed at all, Nate, since 2016, since some of the states did kind of get it wrong? Yeah, so pollsters will say that the main thing they think that was going wrong in 2016 was that you had differential voting by education and that you had too many college-educated voters in your polls. So it used to be that 10 or 20 years ago, whether you went to a four-year college or not did not really predict very much about who you'd vote for, about even numbers of people voting for Republicans and Democrats among college graduates. Now it does. College graduates are much more likely to support today's Democratic Party and less likely to support Trump. So the dirty little secret is that polls tend to get more people who are higher news consumers, who are more educated, right, are more likely to answer pollsters' phone calls. And now if you have too many educated voters in your sample, that's going to skew a little Democratic. And so especially in states that are more working class, like Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, that proved to be a problem. And so most pollsters, although, although not all, are now waiting by education. So if they get too many college educated voters, they will um, literally wait up the non-college voters to get a more representative sample. So it's only so scientific. You can't completely depend on polls to predict the outcome. I would much rather read a poll than read some educated journalist's opinion in New York or Washington about what they think the pulse of the electorate is, right? I would much rather read a poll than rely on kind of flimsy or less empirical indicators like enthusiasm or yard signs or whatever else. Like, look, in some ways, given, like I said before, that only five or 10% of people respond to polls, it's kind of amazing that polls are as accurate as they are, you know? I mean, one thing we do at 538, part of building models, we use data going back to 1936 on how accurate polls were, right? So we account for Dewey versus Truman, and we account for Ronald Reagan, only being ahead by a couple of points in the final polls against Jimmy Carter and then waking up on election morning and winning by a landslide victory. So there are, are lots of cases before 2016 of polls being accurate, but only within certain bounds, right? Um, and part of what our job is to do is to tell you, okay, here is what the true, the true margin of error in polls are. Because it's usually bigger than what the pollster tells you. Um, at the same time, when you get to a point where Biden is leading by seven points nationally and five points in the swing states, that's a bigger error than Trump needed in 2016 to win. If you had the race today and the polls were off by the same amount as they were in 2016, Trump would come close but probably still lose. Biden's margin is actually a bit more comfortable than Clinton's was at the end of 2016 at least. A lot of people believe that some voters aren't honest with pollsters. There's this group of silent voters who don't want to admit they're supporting Donald Trump. Is that a real phenomenon? There's not a ton of evidence for that. There are probably Republicans who are going to vote for Joe Biden and everyone in their communities is voting for Trump and they don't want to say they want to vote for Biden. And the evidence says that most people are honest about who they're going to vote for. Maybe you can have, again, maybe you have some people who want to conceal that. Um, but there's no particular reason to think that it only runs in one direction and that there aren't, for example, you know, there aren't shy Biden voters too. How do you see the move to 
replace Justice Ginsburg playing out in the polls. Is it too early to tell the impact that may be having? It's it's a little early as we're as we're talking right now when we're recording this to know for sure. Um, but there are some initial indications from polling that it's an unpopular move for Republicans to name someone now as opposed to waiting until after the election. Some polls show it being marginally unpopular, some polls showing it being very unpopular, but we haven't seen any kind of post RBG kind of top line numbers that would make us confident about that. If Republicans got a conservative Supreme Court justice to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that is a huge gain that will have, you know, reverberate on American society for decades to come, right? You would be willing to give quite a bit up for a game that large. And the odds are Republicans probably will give something up. They probably will make it a little bit harder for them to keep control of the Senate. There are a lot of senators up in these kind of purple states, um, you know, even some red states, right? But like, this is probably not gonna be a very popular move to try to do this in 45 days um, when people have already started voting, when the ACA and Roe v. Wade, Democrats incredibly claim those are under threat. So it may cost Republicans and they'll probably do it anyway, because like, that's a big win. And elections have consequences, right? And they are still kind of taking advantage of their victories in 2016. And, and although they lost a ton of seats in the House in 2018, they actually picked up two Senate seats in 2018. So they're taking advantage of those. Let's talk about some of the key Senate races that might be really decisive in terms of the balance of the Senate. Arizona, what do you think? So Arizona, Martha McSally is in quite a bit of trouble. Um, she's been behind in almost every poll. Uh, almost all year. Donald Trump is also behind in the presidential race in Arizona. Mark Kelly is an appealing candidate, the Democrat there. Um, McSally, remember, lost two years ago, was appointed to the other Arizona seat. I also don't think that the Ginsburg slot becoming available is going to help her. I mean, she's kind of been very conservative, and I think we'll probably be more conservative than voters there might want. It's not for sure, right? It's not, it's not a 20-point lead for Kelly or something, right? But she's probably the single most likely member to lose her seat. Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell is not very likely to lose his seat. Kentucky is a very red state. Kentuckians may feel personally ambivalent about Mitch McConnell and the swamp and whatever else, but it's a conservative state. Mitch McConnell facilitates conservative policies being passed, and he has been pretty solidly ahead in the polls all year there. Let's talk about South Carolina, Lindsey Graham. That's a bit more competitive. Um, that's a case where polls actually show the Democrat Jamie Harrison in striking distance. Some polls even show that race tied. It's kind of one of these classic races where will the race kind of come home for the home team down the stretch run? By which I mean, usually in a red state, if it's close in mid-September, the Republican tends to win and the reverse in blue states. At the same time, Lindsey Graham has kind of flip-flopped from being sort of a maverick to being very pro-Trump. He's also flip-flopped from saying, I don't think we should name Supreme Court justices during election years to just kind of being very gung-ho about it now. So he might be unique. I mean, he might be the one where like, even though it's a red state, that he has enough kind of personal issues and kind of pisses everyone off. If you're a moderate, you can no longer trust him. If you're a conservative, you may never trust him to begin with, right? Where I don't know. I think he um, will probably win. He's a favorite in our model, but, um, but I wouldn't call him safe. What are some of the other key Senate races that we should talk about, Nate? So uh, Iowa and North Carolina are, uh, are important races. Those are races where they're red-leaning states at this point, but, um, but you have Republican incumbents who both have a track record of supporting Trump a lot, and Trump is in very close races in the presidential races in Iowa and North Carolina, so they may go the same way. Montana, you have Steve Bullock, who is a, a Democratic governor in a red state. Montana at the local level can sometimes be more purple. I think that's actually the race where the Ginsburg slot becoming available may help Republicans. That might be the kind of the exception to the rule because Montana is red enough, especially around issues like uh, abortion, where, where they might just say, okay, you know what, I might like Steve Bullock in the abstract, but actually we in Montana like our conservative Supreme Court, so we're gonna vote for the Republican incumbent Steve Daines instead. Is Susan Collins in trouble? She's in a lot of trouble. Um, being in trouble is not the same thing as losing. She has been, I don't know if she's been counted out before, right? But she has been an institution in Maine for a long time. And therefore, it's a bit risky to assume very much about Susan Collins. But she has been behind Sarah Gideon in the large majority of polls. 
in Maine that we may be growing a bit. Biden is polling decently well in Maine. And although Susan Collins is one of the senators who has said, actually, I think we should hold off until after the election, I'm not sure that bringing back memories for voters of Kavanaugh and that process will be the thing that Susan Collins wants. Before we get into the nitty gritty, you've identified at 538 some perceptible shifts in some of those states. What are they? Over the past month or two, there are some states that have gotten better for Joe Biden and some that have gotten better for Trump. For Biden, he has seen a lot of growth in his margins in Arizona. He has seen also a lot of good polling in Maine, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Um, so those are important states, especially Wisconsin um, and Arizona. And Biden has had polls that he, I'm sure his campaign finds very reassuring there. On the flip side, um, Biden once had a lead in Florida that has drifted down to more of a tie. Democrats don't need Florida, but you have a lot more options for Democrats if you have Florida. It has a lot of electoral votes. Also, Pennsylvania has polled closer than Wisconsin and Michigan. So despite being Biden being from there, Pennsylvania is a long way from, from locked up, pretty competitive state. And so even though Biden's doing pretty well overall, you know, he would feel a lot more secure if he weren't kind of losing ground in polls in, in those two states, Florida and Pennsylvania. At the same time, Trump cannot be happy with um, polls in Arizona, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. So the race is still pretty fluid at this point. I don't know if it's fluid. I'd say that there's a lot of news in the country today. Um, you know, it is too soon to, um, to say that there can't be more developments that happen, obviously between COVID and the economy, and now the Supreme Court pick and the racial protests and the civil unrest and violence around those sometimes, right? And everything else and a vaccine, right? And the usual October surprise, there's a lot of news um, that could still affect the race. There are three debates to be had from now until November. Um, so far, that news hasn't really affected the race all that much, right? Trump is behind by around seven points in national polls that will drift up to eight or nine for Biden or down to six, but like it hasn't really moved very much. And so the problem for Trump is that, um, you know, people seem to have made their choices a long time ago. There are not that many undecided voters. There are not that many swing voters. And, you know, the math looks a little tough for Trump unless, unless polls are wrong. And again, polls would probably have to be wrong by a bit more than they were in 2016 for Trump to win. And Donald Trump needs Florida absolutely to win. Joe Biden can win without Florida. Joe Biden can win without Florida. It would be kind of a, almost a winner take all state. If Biden were to win Florida, then almost everything else can go wrong for Biden and he can win the electoral college. So yeah, it's kind of a, a it's a must win state for, um, for Trump or at least very close to it. What impact has this movement for racial justice had on voters reflected in the polling that you've seen? This has generally not been, though, a good issue for Trump. Um, people do not trust Trump on handling race relations. They did not like his response to the protest when he did the kind of Bible um, a photo shoot in Washington, D.C., outside the White House. It was one of the lowest moments in the polls. He lost ground there. Um, you know, there is also evidence that his law and order campaign um, was not successful. There were a bunch of polls of Wisconsin and Minnesota conducted shortly thereafter uh, after Trump tried to pivot to a law and order theme and they showed Trump not gaining ground, maybe losing ground. So I don't know. I, I know Trump thinks it's a winning issue for him, but people generally don't trust Trump on issues related to, to the protest, race, violence, right? They may, even if they agree with Trump that there is a problem and that these protests have become violent in some states, they definitely do not think by and large that Trump is the solution to that problem. They think that he kind of fans the flames. Is there a particular issue that is really helping Joe Biden? You know, I think Biden did a good job with the choice of Kamala Harris, who has, you know, you always worry is going to be fallout, negative storylines, vetting issues, but Kamala Harris has had almost nothing negative written about her. And if the first principles do no harm with the VP pick, then that's been successful so far. I think in some ways it's um, helpful for Democrats when they have a, um, an election where their candidate is way ahead to kind of have not so much drama, not overthink things, right? I mean, obviously Biden has to do well in the debates. Obviously Biden could stand to do a bit more outreach to Hispanic voters. There are some polls, well, this is disputed, but some polls actually show Trump having game ground with Hispanics. So that's an area where Biden needs to improve. Um, but by and large, he's kind of gotten to run the campaign that, um, that he wanted to run, I think, right? Which is to let the campaign be all about Trump and all about the direction of the country and to be a relatively neutral 
and safe, quote unquote, alternative for, for, for moderates and independents. Look, I think there is a 25% chance that Trump wins. I believe our model. And a lot of those do involve a comeback of some kind rather than the polls being wrong on election day. And Trump still needs to find a way to, to make the race closer. Can he do that? I, I don't know. I would rather be in Biden's position.